and uh, we move to the next speaker, um, who is uh, Professor Emil van Schaftingen. Hello. You can already start uh, you with us. Great. Uh, you can start uh, sharing your screen. Uh, he's the director of the Metabolic Research Group at the, the Duve Institute from the Université Catholique de Louvain. Hope it, it's pronounced correctly. And um, he will tell us about uh, metabolite repair and aging. Please, you can also uh, share full screen. Yeah. Um, I'm a bit of an outsider here because I'm not working <laughs> on directly on aging. I'm working on this subject here, metabolite repair, and I've been working on this for the last uh, 20 years, and I've also worked on some aspects of protein repair. And what I believe is that uh, this something, this, in order to have enjoy healthy um, aging, we need to have healthy molecules. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that deals with this problem of keeping our molecules healthy. Um, I think that you would probably agree that uh, damage to DNA is a problem, uh, is causing premature aging, but maybe that also damage to proteins and damage to small molecules participate in the aging process. And that's what I want to uh, tell you today and give you some arguments that support that. Nature has been dealing with the problem of damage of biomolecules and for <laughs> billions, uh, billions of years. And how did it deal with it by, by conceiving and putting, uh, well, installing repair mechanism. There are repair mechanisms for DNA, everybody knows that. Maybe that people are less familiar with the problem of protein repair there are several protein repair mechanisms that have been established, and even less that people are aware of metabolite repair mechanism. And uh, nature has also taken care of the fact that it has to minimize the formation of chemically reactive metabolites. People are used to the problem of ROS, but there is more than ROS in the problem of chemically reactive metabolites, and you need to destroy the most reactive ones. I will tell you about that today. And I think that this makes that uh, what I'm going to talk about has some relationship, clear relationship with aging. Now, first, uh, metabolite repair, what's the problem? Well, people have overemphasized in textbook of biochemistry, the substrate specific of specificity of enzyme by saying that because the enzyme were extremely specific, there was no side reaction to take care about. This is not true. All enzymes have some minor side activities, which make them to act slowly on molecules that are present in cells that resemble their substrate. And by doing so, they produce non-classical metabolites. And the problem with these non-classical metabolites is that they will tend to accumulate because they usually are not a substrate. This is the example here. You have a, a normal reaction here with an enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. It will also catalyze slowly this reaction on a molecule that is resembling its substrate and it will produce a product that is not a substrate for enzyme two and will tend to accumulate unless you have a repair enzyme. We, we started being interested in this problem by studying a disease in which L2 hydroxyglutarate accumulates. L2 hydroxyglutarate is distinct from D2 hydroxyglutarate. I won't talk about D2 hydroxyglutarate. This is a neurological disease. I will say you a few more words uh, about this disease and uh, where you have accumulation of this L2 hydroxyglutarate, which is a non-classical metabolite. What we have done is to identify the enzyme that destroys normally L2 hydroxyglutarate. And uh, it's an enzyme of the mitochondria that catalyzes an irreversible reaction that gives back alpha ketoglutarate. We have shown that this enzyme is mutated in this disease. And the surprise came 
uh, when we tried to identify the enzyme that is making L2-hydroxyglutarate, we were thinking it must be a specific enzyme that does that. No, not at all. What we eventually came, to, uh, what we eventually concluded was that this was due, this formation was catalyzed by side activities of well-known enzyme of intermediary metabolism, malate dehydrogenase and lactate dehydrogenase, which had tiny activities to catalyze the reduction of alpha ketoglutarate onto L2 hydroxyglutarate reactions that were typically 1 million times lower than the, react the normal reactions that these enzymes catalyze. Yet, because, uh, okay, what's wrong here? Okay, yet because uh, these enzymes are extremely abundant in cells, uh, we make every day, thanks to them, we make every day grams of L2 hydroxyglutarate and we need this repair enzyme to destroy it un unless uh, uh, it accumulates. If, if we don't have that enzyme, it accumulates and accumulates particularly in our brain where it's, it is causing damage. This just to show you the, the, quickly the phenotype of L2 hydroxyglutarate aciduria it causes mental retardation, neurological symptoms that are becoming progressively more severe with time. So it's a progressive disease. There are frequently brain tumors uh, after a few uh, decennias. And uh, what is maybe interesting in the context of this uh, aging, this meeting on aging, is that in some patients, uh, the diagnosis is not made in during infancy, but in old patients and sometimes even up to 70 years of age. And um, this is when there are some mutations that do not completely abolish the activity of L2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase. So here in these patients, there is certainly not healthy aging because of this uh, defect in metabolite repair. Now, is metabolite repair common? I will show you that it is extremely common. But before telling you that, I want to extend a little bit the concept. We need a repair enzyme to destroy metabolites that are made by side reaction of enzymes, but we need them also to destroy uh, abnormal metabolites that are made uh, thanks to spontaneous reaction that occur in cells because quite a few of our uh, metabolic intermediates are chemically reactive. And some of them are extremely ch chemically reactive and we need to destroy them in order to prevent them from, from uh, intervening in other reactions and damaging proteins and other metabolites. So when we take everything into account, we we can make the conclusion that um, metabolite repair and damage pre preemption mechanism are extremely common. I'm showing you here the example of glycolysis, which as you know, uh, is a very well known metabolic pathway with 11 steps. And I'm showing you here the metabolite repair and metabolite damage uh, mechanism that are known presently. I count 11 of them. This is a lot. This is as many as the number of enzymes that there are in glycolysis. And uh, quickly um, here, um, sorry, uh, we have in total for these uh, third, uh, 11 mechanisms, we have eight repair reactions and three preemption mechanism, a total of 13 enzymes that have been identified and that, that, that are working in these processes and seven diseases due to genetic defects in one or the other of these enzymes are known presently. And I'm showing them here to you, um, uh, at least mo most of them. And of course, some of them are not involved at all in any process of aging, but are nonetheless interesting. Uh, for instance, neutropenias <laughs> in two uh, rare inborn errors of metabolism are due to a problem 
of um, metabolite repair defect. And because we, we, we have been able to identify that, we have been able to propose a treatment for these neutropenias, which is very successful and which is now applied worldwide in more than 100 patients. 100 patients is a big figure when you're considering that these are extra rare diseases. We had just before uh, in the presentation of the previous uh, speakers, a word about the importance of nicotinamide. These two enzymes, NADH dehydratase and NADH epimerase, are catalyzing the maintenance of NADH and NADPH, which can get sometimes hydrated and become something that is no longer used by dehydrogenases. We have two enzymes to destroy that, Two enzyme defects have been, the two enzyme defects have been described. This has nothing to do with aging. Uh, this leads to diseases that are mostly fatal before two years of age. Now, if I'm now restricting myself to uh, the, the, the problems of uh, metabolite maintenance uh, that are potentially related with aging, I can see four of them. I have already mentioned L2-hydroxyglutaric aciduria. I will now talk about a, a, a special form of Parkinson's disease and of uh, two other genes that are potentially uh, involved in uh, aging. Now, Parkinson's disease, as you know, is an age-related disease. In some cases, it has a clear genetic origin. There are dominant forms, there are recessive forms. And I will just talk about this form here, which is due to mutation in a protein called PARC7 or DJ1. This protein has been extremely studied because it's a very interesting, uh, there are more than 1,000 papers on this, on this protein. And it's very important indeed to identify the function of this protein. But until recently, there was no uh, real consensus on what this protein was doing, because uh, if you would knock out the protein, uh, you would find uh, results that do, did not confirm uh, the previous hypothesis. This has changed now, thanks to the work of Guido Bommer, one of my colleagues, uh, well, heading a separate group at the Duke Institute in Brussels, what Guido has found is that this protein is something that is an enzyme that serves to destroy a metabolite that hadn't been identified until then. And this metabolite, it's not truly a metabolite, it's a side product made from a conventional uh, metabolite of glycolysis known as 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate spontaneously uh, gets uh, degraded to cyclic 1,3-monophosphoglycerate, which is an extremely potent reagent for amino group, which will react with amino groups of proteins and of metabolites extremely quickly in a matter of seconds. And what PARC7 does is to destroy this metabolite. And because you need to have this metabolite extremely quickly broken down, you need to have a high concentration of PARC7 because you don't want that in the course of, uh, you, you, it, you don't want to, that the diffusion limits the destruction of this metabolite by PARC7. So I think that uh, this is really indicating that um, PARC7 is an anti-aging enzyme to the extent that you admit that Parkinson's disease is a uh, disease of uh, uh, oldening, of, uh, of aging. No, I'm now talking about the last two examples, uh, PGP and FN3K and FN3KRP, because we were quite surprised to, to, to see this paper appearing a couple of years ago, uh, a very interesting paper uh, based on a study of uh, a number of German centenarians and long-lived uh, uh, individuals th that were compared uh, with uh, controls less than 60 years of age. And this is an exome-wide association study. And two genes were named in the title of this, um, of this paper. And this was amazing to us because 
These are two proteins that we were the first to, to describe the function. Now, um, I'm, I'm telling you, you know, the function of this proteins. The first one is called PGP. That's not the best name. It has been named like that uh, 20 years ago when it was sequenced for the first time. But what this protein does is to destroy two extremely uh, damaging molecules that are called 4-phosphoenrytonate and 2-phospholactate. And one of them is formed as a side activity of the central glycolytic enzyme GAPDH. And it is very embarrassing to have this molecule because it is a uh, transition state analog of the enzyme catalyzing the conversion of 6-phosphogluconate to ribulose 5-phosphate in the pentose phosphate pathway. And it is an extremely strong inhibitor. You need to destroy this inhibitor. You need to destroy also 2-phospholactate, which is made by a side activity of pyruvate kinase because it inhibits the enzyme that is making the powerful regulator of glycolysis, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. You won't be surprised that the PGP knockout mutation is embryonic lethal in mice. Because when you knock out in cells, this, this enzyme here, PGP, you see an increase in 4-phosphoritronate by 100-fold and the same for the concentration of 6-phosphogliconate. This is not a 30% increase, 100-fold increase. Now, um, centenarians have probably higher PGP activity, this is not known, or wider tissue distribution of this enzyme. This is how I can potentially explain the link between PGP and uh, the, the old age of these people. And uh, I'm not talking about the other gene that had been identified um, and which is FN3KRP. FN3KRP is for fructosamine tree kinase related protein. These two genes encoding FN3K and FN3KRP are sitting next, next to each other in the genome. And I'm not sure that in the study that has been published, uh, the investigators could really uh, ascribe the linkage to FN3KRP rather than to FN3K, I think that both of them are linked. Now, I tell you what this enzyme is doing. Well, you may know that glucose reacts with amino groups of proteins and also of micromolecules. And that after a, a, a so-called Amado rearrangement, this gives rise to a fructosamine. What we have discovered more than 20 years ago is that there is an enzyme, fructosamine tree kinase, that serves to phosphorylate the third carbon of the fructosamine moiety of this, uh, of this, of this molecule, and that this destabilizes uh, the fructosamine and makes it to detach from the protein and or from the micromolecule, and which is then released in, in free form. Now, FN3KRP compared to FN3K works on derivatives of ribose. That's one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to say is that there is a highly variable FN3K activity in human erythrocytes. Uh, it, this is very unusual. You have a fourfold range of activity if you're measuring the activity in different persons. And this high activity is stable with age. So it's a linked to SNPs that are present in the FN3K and the FN3KRP genes. Now, I'm showing you here the, the results of the study that I was mentioning before. You see here that the linkage is uh, the most um, uh, significant uh, SNPs are present uh, there just where the FN3KRP and the FN3K gene are. And so I believe that centenarians, they actually have a higher expression of FN3KRP. This has been said by uh, in this paper, but they, got, they must have higher FN3K and FN3KRP activities that enable them to destroy more efficiently glycation products. And I'm arriving to my conclusion 
defects in metabolite repair or damage control may, I think, in some cases promote aging and maybe that they may promote non-healthy aging. Uh, this indicates that damage of small molecules and proteins participate in uh, aging. We need to further identify metabolite and protein repair uh, mechanism, but this is a difficult job because we are searching things that are unknown and that in some cases are present in small amounts and that the enzymes that serve to deal with them are working at very low activities. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I thank also all the people with whom I've been working uh, during uh, the last years. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emil. Uh, I think we have just uh, time for one question. Uh, we are running a bit out of time. So uh, the question is from Leon. Uh, how conserved are the enzymes and metabolic cascades you discussed across species? Would you expect them to play similar roles in cold-blooded species with similar uh, overall aging statistics? The, the, the enzymes that serve to repair NADHX are present in all species, archaea, your bacteria, all vertebrates, all uh, multicellular organisms. That's one. And this for many of the other enzymes. Part 7 is conserved in yeast, is conserved in bacteria, is conserved in uh, drosophila. And um, for those, Guido Bomer has shown that it plays the same role in these different organisms I just mentioned. So many of these repair proteins are extremely conserved. Uh, so uh, we are talking about a general phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, explanation and this talk.